Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about the business of craft beer and why craft beer has become such a popular product. My guest today is Bill Sysak. Bill is a certified Cicerone. He is also the co-founder of Wild Barrel Brewing Company in San Marcos. And additionally, he happens to be on the advisory board for the San Diego State University's Business of Craft Beer Certificate Program. Welcome, Bill, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I just introduced you as a certified Cicerone. Some of our members in the audience are, th are wondering, what is a Cicerone? So a uh, Cicerone is the craft beer or beer equivalent to a wine sommelier. Uh, there are different levels. There's a certified beer server, which is the initial level that you'll find a lot of craft beer tasting room and restaurant uh, servers and bartenders hold. Certified Cicerone is closer to the advanced sommelier level. And then there is an advanced Cicerone that has just been developed and also a master Cicerone program where there's about a half dozen people in the country, actually the world, that actually hold that title. Okay, well let's move on to beer and let's talk specifically about the history of beer for a moment before we focus in on craft beer. So if we look at the history of beer, it's been with us a very long time. In fact, uh, a lot of archeologists now say that beer was with us at the beginning of our agricultural transformation from the hunter-gatherer phase of human development, which happened somewhere between seven to 10,000 years ago. So why did beer become an important part of the human development process as we started to settle in with agriculture? Well, many anthropologists and archaeologists actually believe that beer uh, is the reason why we went from hunter-gatherer to this uh, stasis position of being uh, agricultural society. Uh, they believe that accidentally grains and seeds as they were picked were fermented uh, through being left out in the rain and they started to make kind of a porridge or mash uh, with this and they realized they enjoyed it, not just for the nutritional value, but for the fact that it was kind of a happy juice for them. And if you look throughout the history of civilization, every great society actually had some form of alcoholic beverage that they enjoyed, whether it was at their feasts when they were celebrating uh, victories uh, against other tribes or uh, a great hunt where they had pulled down a woolly mammoth, for example, or just any type of celebration through marriage, birth of a child, something like that. We find that beverages have been around and beer was one of those progenitors for that. All right, and you talked about uh, the fact that uh, beer was kind of the happy juice and it was a little chunkier in the, in the beginning than Correct. it was uh, today. It's all liquid, but it right. wasn't always like that. And there are stories about uh, the Egyptians when they were building the pyramids. Right. Uh, those workers that were putting the stones together were given uh, liters of beer as part of their compensation, which provided them nourishment and refreshment. And uh, that's uh, how the pyramids were built, apparently. So it's been with us a long time. So when we talk about uh, the distinctions of the different kinds of beer, some people wonder what's the difference between an ale and a lager. But you have a very right. good. Uh, analogy you can use right. that involves cooking. So all beer is beer, but it's broken down into two main categories, ales or lagers, and those are based off of the yeast strains that are used. Ales have a tendency to be a top fermenting yeast strain that works on the beer creating uh, alcohol and CO2 by eating the starches that are converted to sugars in the cooking process. And those uh, top fermenting yeasts are, happen very fast. The beer is made much shorter period of time. It has much more aggressive flavors. Where a lager is a bottom fermenting yeast that was uh, identified much later on, probably around 14th, 15th century from cool storage where the top fermenting yeast didn't survive in caverns and the lager or bottom fermenting yeast started to. They go much slower. And the way I equate that for non-brewers is if you look at cooking and you take uh, stir fry where you're very fast, aggressive, high heat, big 
dominant flavors of things like garlic, uh, ginger, uh, lemongrass, and it's done very quickly and very aromatic. That is more what an ale is. They're much more aggressive in aroma and flavor profile, where a lager is more, you can equate it to a crock pot, taking a, a pot roast and some onions, potatoes, and carrots, going off to work and coming back home. Sure, the aroma is still great, it tastes great, but it's much more subtle and melded. So lagers are much longer to brew. They take, not to brew, to ferment. They take more than anywhere from two weeks to three, four months. And as we talk about the history of beer, continue that conversation into the United States. Of course, we had prohibition here in the 1920s into the early 30s. But after the prohibition was lifted and the Great Depression was over, the major brewing companies in the United States, such as Anheuser-Busch and Coors, which is now Miller Coors, right. and Pabst Blue Ribbon, which is right here in Los Angeles, those big companies started to consolidate and beer became a very industrial kind of process as opposed to the smaller, um, much more what we would call craft type brewers that existed right. before that time. And that was part of the whole mobilization during World War II and the couple of decades after. But then in the 1970s, there was this movement afoot in the United States where a small number of fellows decided, we're gonna start doing our own brewing, and they became the original craft brewers. How did that trend eventually catch on? So in, you're right, it was a wasteland. Uh, prior to Prohibition, there were 1,700 breweries. Uh, after Prohibition was repealed in 1933, 700 breweries opened, but by the time 1965 rolled around, there was only about 100 uh, these mega breweries, these big factory-run breweries. Uh, a gentleman named Fritz Maytag in 1965, who had just graduated from Stanford, uh, discovered that his local brewery, Anchor Brewing Company out of San Francisco was going out of business, and he went and ended up buying a controlling interest in eventually all of it. He was what we mark as the beginning of the craft beer revolution. Over the next 13 or so years, he developed a bunch of English styles that were became quite famous, including the very first modern IPA made in America. And then uh, by 1980, it had slowly started to catch on. A couple things happened before that. Uh, Alan Cranston, one of our U.S. Senators in California, uh, wrote a law because when they repealed prohibition, they had forgot to legalize home brewing. So he actually had Jimmy Carter sign a bill where they legalized home brewing. Uh, home brew clubs started up and it became well known that the beer could taste something different than the fizzy yellow beer that our fathers had tasted before that. And then by the 1980s, it started up with Sierra Nevada and many other breweries, and now we have over 7,200 craft breweries in America. Well, let's talk about Sierra Nevada for a moment because they are located in Chico, which is mm -hmm. north of Sacramento. I've actually seen that brewery. And uh, it was started by a gentleman by the name of Ken Grossman in the 1970s. And he did something rather radical in the uh, brewing industry. He decided to utilize wet hops. So he went to Oregon and found these wet hops and started using those in the brewing process. Uh, what exactly are hops? Why, are, and why and how are they used in the brewing process? And what are wet hops? So there are four main ingredients found in beer, whether it's an ale or lager. A water, of course. Yeast, which we already talked about, activates and creates CO2 and alcohol. And then there's grain or barley primarily is used by brewers. And that kind of acts as the body of the beer, giving off a lot of great flavors and aromas. And then hops are kind of the spice of beer, if you think of them. Uh, hops have been around for a very long time. Even in Egypt, as we were talking about, there were over 250 different apothecary recipes that had hops involved. They weren't first used in beer till about the 1100. Uh, AD. But what we know about hops now are they were originally used as an antimicrobial to stop uh, infections happening in beer, but as modern brewers we use them for bitterness, flavor, and aroma. So early on in the brewing process you use them as a bittering agent. But what was unique about what, what Ken did was he went and took fresh hops, which are what we determine as wet hops, and he used them in a dry hopping process, which is where you add them after the fermentation has taken place, and he's put, put in wet hops, and those were the Cascade hops, which basically are the most famous hops in the craft beer uh, revolution, so to speak. And those wet hops, 
uh, allow it to give off these wonderful pungent aromas and flavors of pine and grapefruit that made his uh, preeminent beer, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, the probably one of the most important beers in the craft beer industry history. And it's uh, significant that we're talking about Sierra Nevada because they are one of the top craft beer companies along with uh, Samuel Adams beer from the Boston Beer Company. So when we talk about craft beer, maybe we should define what that means in terms of production and style and size of the brewery and all of that. So traditionally the terms uh, craft or the term craft beer means that uh, the brewing company has to be small, it has to be independent, and it has to be traditional Correct. in the way it conducts operations. So what do those terms mean and how big is too big to be considered a small brewing company? So let's talk about small first. Small is less than six million barrels uh, produced a year. What is a barrel of beer? A barrel of beer, if you remember those keg stands that used to be at those parties when you were in high school and college, that's a half barrel of beer. So two of those kegs, 31 gallons, equals a barrel of beer. So you have to make less than six million barrels of beer to be considered a small brewery. To be independent, you have to be owned by, or have no ownership by a major non-craft brewery of more than 25%. So if AB InBev bought 20% of a brewery, they'd still be considered independent, but the 25 percent mark we hold over. And traditional simply means you use those ingredients I mentioned before to improve and enhance flavor as opposed to a lot of the macro brewery giants where they use those in, they substitute ingredients like rice, corn syrup and sugar to decrease the flavor of beer. Craft brewers want to enhance the flavor of beer. All right, we just have a minute or two before the break, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the growth of the craft beer industry in, in just the last 10 years or so. I know that there was a huge jump in the number of barrels produced between 2009 and 2014. In 2009, there were about 9 million barrels of craft beer produced in the country, and then in 2014, it had jumped all the way up to like 22 to 23 million barrels right. annually. So that was almost a 250% growth rate. However, it started to level off as all things do. Nothing can grow that fast forever. Right. And so Fortune Magazine came out with some information recently where they said, well, the era of big growth for craft beer is over. What's your uh, assessment of that? I would say volumetrically, that's probably close to true. Like I said earlier, there are 7,200 craft breweries. There's another 2,500 in planning. So I foresee a day when there's 10,000 craft breweries in America, but most of those will be hyper-local where they have a tasting room where they serve in a smaller area, just like uh, most breweries were two centuries ago. So I foresee it being a mature industry where we'll continue to have single digit growth, but we'll continue to take more market share from the beer industry as a whole, as people want that higher quality, better flavor and aroma. And on that note, we're gonna to have to go to the break. And when we come back from the break, we'll talk about craft breweries in Southern California and how the industry is thriving right here. Stay tuned. Did you know that you can study climate change or find fuel in rocks or even produce synthetic flavors using chemistry? Chemists study chemical reactions and compounds and how they work in our bodies and the world around us. The opportunities are endless with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, and my guest today is Bill Sysak, a certified Cicerone. Now, Bill, before we went to the break, I said we were going to talk about the West Coast and uh, the craft brewing industry here, which is uh, pretty dynamic. Um, right. But before we go to that, I want to talk a little bit about another trend that's going on in the, in the craft beer industry, and that's the fact that the big players in the beverage industry, we're talking about Anheuser-Busch, we're talking about uh, Miller Coors, we're talking about Pabst, those kinds of companies, they're looking very hard at these craft beers because that seems to be where there's a lot of growth and a lot of interest. And so these companies are starting to uh, get into the business of buying out some of these small right. craft breweries. And so the question is, what will that do to the actual craft beer 
the product line that they're buying out. You know, corporations have a little bit different mission statement or a business plan, I should say, than the, the uh, smaller independent brewers. The independent brewers are focused on quality, 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 at least they should be, and uh, the corporate brewers are interested in profits shaving costs and returning dividends to stockholders. So let's talk about that for a moment. What do you think that's going to do to the craft beers that are purchased by the big guys? Well, I think there's a, a couple dynamics involved. One is they realized early on in the last 12 or 13 years that they couldn't compete as far as devoting the effort. It wasn't worth their effort to make these high quality, flavorful beers. They, it, it just didn't make sense to them fiscally. But what we're seeing now is they started to buy up these breweries, slow down the growth of craft beer. And the problem is when they buy these breweries, they don't necessarily keep the same quality of the product. Uh, a lot of times it could be as simple as making the cardboard box that the case of beer comes from uh, thinner, less material. But sometimes it's taking that same beer and taking it away from that little brewery and brewing it at one of their mega facilities. So the quality isn't always there and that can be an issue. They have a lot of problems when they're making these beers um, as far as keeping the historical value around and the customers. So what they're doing is going into new markets with the beer and maintaining the same level of growth for these little breweries that they're buying up. Well, that's an interesting uh, point about quality and cost because a lot of people when they uh, go to a restaurant or they go out and decide to uh, take their friends to a craft brewery, they notice that the cost of craft beer is more than the traditional brewers. Right. And people may say, well, why am I paying more for beer? Isn't beer beer? Why am I paying more for a craft beer? So it's, it's an artisanal product, and with any artisanal product, whether it's a cut of meat or a type of cheese, Kraft Singles versus uh, Stilton Bassett, uh, Colson Bassett Stilton Blue Cheese, for example, from England, you're gonna pay a premium. The other factor that's involved is Anheuser-Busch has 11 major factories. Stone Brewing, which is, I believe, the ninth largest craft brewery in America at 360,000 barrels, Anheuser-Busch in all their plants spills more of that beer in a month than, they, than Stone produces. So they have the economy of scale, right? So they can charge a lot less for their beers. And once again, besides the factor that we use better quality ingredients in many cases when it comes to craft beer. So let me get your opinion. If you were gonna buy a craft beer, would you buy one that's been recently purchased by a big brewer or would you buy one that's independent? Well, other than the fact that I'm in, as an independent craft brewer and support them, I would always go independent. And that's not just with beer, it's with anything because I wanna support that artisanal producer and keep them in business as opposed to buying something that's made industrially. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's just a better, win-win for us if we have more of these artisanal producers in any aspect of business. All right, well, let's talk about the West Coast and in particular the San Diego area. As I understand it, you grew up actually in the LA Orange County area, uh, but your business has been in the San Diego area. Right. You've been very involved in that scene and San Diego is well known for craft breweries. It's a very dynamic market for that. Talk about that a little bit. Why did San Diego become such a dynamic market for craft beer? So San Diego is known as the capital of craft. Uh, they have 200 breweries and brewery tasting rooms just in San Diego County alone. They were not in the early periods. The very first brewery that was produced in San Diego County was uh, a brewery called Bolt Brewing in Fallbrook in 1987. Carl Strauss opened in 1989 and it grew from there. I think a lot of the dynamics that made San Diego so competitive and great is you had these bigger breweries. Ballast Point, which unfortunately is no longer an independent brewery, uh, Ale Smith, Stone, Pizza Port, Carl Strauss in the mid 90s that came along and they decided to to rely on just quality beer. That bred a lot of other brewers from their training programs, from home brewing that they brought on, and they built this whole cultural shift there where people started to appreciate craft beer, and that allows San Diego to continue to be a dynamic market even with that many breweries in place. Where is the market going for craft beer? In San Diego and elsewhere? So it will continue to grow. 
it'll stay hyper local. Uh, regional brewery is considered a brewery that makes 15,000 barrels a year. Uh, for example, my brewery, we're at our first year anniversary coming up, we're just gonna make a thousand barrels this first year, right? So there'll be a lot of these little breweries that stay under 5,000 barrels that support themselves locally by having customers and followers. Uh, we're finding that the millennials are really driving this hyper-localism and quality of products and, and that's helping the craft beer industry as a whole. And an important part of that, as you were mentioning, millennials driving the market is local sourcing. Right. And we talked about uh, Ken Grossman going into Oregon because he lives in Northern California, right. so Oregon wasn't too far away to get the wet hops. So are we seeing that kind of thing here too? We're seeing it on a smaller scale. There are some hop growers starting up in San Diego County. It's more driven by the climatic area that they're at. Uh, with breweries as opposed to wineries, wineries will normally uh, place themselves right next to where they're gonna grow their grapes. Breweries will have a tendency to just go with the best quality ingredients. So it could be malt from the Midwest, but it, malted grain, but it could also be from Germany or Austria or the Czech Republic, for example. So it's not as concerning as that, it's about the quality of the products, who has the best quality products. And when we talk about craft beer, most of the craft beer seem to be in the category of what's called IPA or India Pale Ale. What is India Pale Ale and why is it uh, so popular among aficionados and also customers? So there are hundreds of different variations on beer styles. I would say IPA makes up the largest uh, commercial segment as far as uh, on-premise and off-premise sales and that's why we look at that and they've led that for the last 10 years. IPA means India Pale Ale. It was never produced in India. It was produced for English troops uh, back in the days when they used to say the sun never set on the English Empire because it was so large an area. So they'd have to ship a beer that was potent enough and resilient enough to survive pre-industrial uh, uh, refrigeration and things like that. So the IPA became a very popular beer style in America. It started up in the 70s going into the 80s with Anchor Brewing in Sierra Nevada. And it's really just a big flavorful uh, aromatic beer because hops derive a lot of characteristics that can be anything from tropical fruits to citrus, to pine, to earthiness, floral, and those are really fun beers to make. So people really like them and there's been a huge following. There's been a lot of variations of these IPAs coming out. There are now hazy IPAs, there's low alcohol IPAs, there's IPAs using Belgian yeast, and that trend is gonna continue to move on. The next trend after IPAs is IPAs. Well, since we're in California and we're talking about the West Coast, what about the wine industry versus the craft beer industry? We know that we have a lot of wineries and a lot of wine tasting, and it's a huge uh, draw here in California. Can craft beer become like that? I think it can, and we're seeing that in a lot of small areas where we're seeing 20 breweries that are within a very short uh, area. So people, we have beer tourism, just like wine tourism, when you go up to, say, Napa or Sonoma or the Central Coast. We're seeing that same kind of uh, effect. And with these local breweries where they're small production, they rely primarily on people coming into their tasting rooms. So by making high quality products and beer, the growth potential is there. As I said, 7,200 craft breweries, there's almost right around 900 craft breweries in California. That's the largest state as far as breweries. But there's 7,000 wineries in California, so we have room to grow. Well, if we're talking about craft breweries, not all of them succeed. There are some that end up going out of business, just like with any business. Uh, why is that? What are the craft uh, brewing companies that are not making it? What are they doing wrong and what do they need to do to turn things around? Well, it could be multiple f factors from not having enough financing to poor quality product, which is probably the main factor, to growing up into a regional brewery and, and constantly having to chase your tail to continue to grow and not being able to sustain that with the macro brewers above them and all the local little craft breweries below. Uh, but really it's all about, like you said earlier, quality, quality, quality. If you're not making a dynamic product, if you're not making a great guest experience both in your tasting room and have well-informed staff to teach these guests about what you're serving, you're not going to succeed. You talked earlier about um, economy of scale, and whereas the big brewing companies, uh, the major 
like Anheuser-Busch and so on, if they have a bad batch, they can throw it out and it's not a big deal. What do you tell uh, small brewers if they come up with a batch that isn't 100% the way it should be? Same exact thing, dump it. If you make a beer and it's not the way it's supposed to be, don't call it something else, dump it. If you make a beer and it tastes like something else, don't do that. And don't throw it in a wine or bourbon barrel and think it's gonna get better. You only have one chance to build a reputation with each of your customers, and you wanna maintain the highest standards of quality when you're doing that. So it's very important. Do not rely on that. Take the loss and brew it again the right way. Let's talk for just a moment about your uh, program in San Di at San Diego State University and the extended education program that uh, folks can take in the business of craft beer. What kinds of courses do you offer there and what do people learn? So the Business Craft Beer has been around for, the program has been around for five years. And we've had over 1,500 people come through and, and more than half of those have graduated from the course. Uh, I teach two courses. I teach the entry level course, which has a broad spectrum of everything to do with beer. And then I also teach the Secrets to Exceptional Beer and Food Pairing, which is a six week course where you're basically getting to eat and drink the whole time. Uh, but there's beer styles and then there's also a scope driven towards uh, opening a business. So there's building a business plan, how to effectively use distribution as a key, um, front of the house service. So there's a whole spectrum for, it doesn't matter whether you wanna start, uh, start your own craft beer business, whether it's a bar or a brewery, or whether you're in the industry and just wanna learn more, or you're just a hobbyist and enjoy talking and drinking about, talking and drinking beer. That leads to my last question. We only have about 30 seconds okay. left. So how would you assess the educational level of folks in Southern California in terms of their knowledge of craft beer? I think you, there's about 15% of the whole population that understands what craft beer is and at, they're at many levels from advanced to intermediary to beginner. And the broad spectrum of people in across the world is about 80 to 90% of people that just aren't informed about craft beer. So it's really important that we continue to inform them through shows like yours and educational programs like SDSU. And on that note, we do have to close the program, but thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us today. Oh, thank you, it was a great time. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.